Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Laura. Welcome to Where Work Meets Life. Today we are on a second episode with Cy Wakeman, a return guest to the podcast based on her latest book, Life's Messy, Live Happy. And last time we explored uh, living contently amidst the messiness in life. Today we're going to talk more about evolving yourself to live happy in this messy world. And I think we've really um, had a lot of suffering in this world. The world continues to be complex, confusing. Um, it's easy to become cynical, resentful, and fearful uh, about life and work and all that goes on in between. And we're going to talk today with Cy Wakeman about evolving yourself in life and in love, and the powerful tools that she shares in this book. So welcome back, Sai. Thank you. So glad to be here. I um, really appreciated how your book gets into resiliency and how we can emerge evolved versus traumatized from life's curveballs. So can you share a couple of tips around being more resilient and evolving? I think often when we find ourselves in the unpreferred reality, we kind of assume that the outcome is predetermined, like we'll get through it, but we'll be stressed by it or traumatized by it. And I don't think enough people understand that even from traumatic events that we would you know, decide were traumatic um, as, a, as a collective, more people emerge grown transform for the better than actually like traumatized. And when we look in the research and see what the difference is, it's a couple of things. They usually had some people in their lives um, that at the appropriate time held space and empathized and saw that they were pained and struggling, but then made the call to greatness to say, let's look at the multiple positive possibilities to come out of this and let's focus on how can this experience grow you for the better. And most people, if we're in a kind of a victim mindset, we only see how things have harmed us or how we've had to succeed in spite of these things. But we miss some beautiful information if we could go within and allow ourselves to be evolved by what happens. Ask ourselves, where can I grow next so that I can move through this messy world more skillfully? Where can I um, take this situation? And without resentment, without um, reaction, just say, how could I move through the world differently? And what is the beautiful shaping that this experience has given to me? So I do a lot of self-reflections. In the moment I self-reflect on what's my part in this, um, you know, um, what could I do to help? In the moment that toggles me up and puts me, I can plug and play differently with accountability. But I also do a lot of contemplation. What's my red thread here through life? What's my theme here? Why am I back here with a similar situation? Like, what is mine in all of this? Where do I need to grow next? And I do a lot of that work through great questioning and contemplation. And so I think a lot of us grow older, but few of us grow wiser because we're not involved in deep contemplation and reflection. Yeah, yeah, absolutely well put. And I think that's part of rising or raising your consciousness uh, level. And that brings me to talking about spirituality and how I can tell how deeply spiritual you are from our conversations and from your books, uh, especially this latest book. Um, and I'm also on a spiritual growth journey. And I'd love to know how you bring spirituality up to your clients without getting it confused by organized religion or getting pushback on spirituality because I think it's so so deeply important but how do you bring that into your work side so one thing I do is I don't want to get tied to any constructs of even religion or even calling it spirituality I like to take it away from that that it's just we all have a common human experience and there's universal principles that have been with us for thousands and thousands of years. 
and they didn't just come from religion. They've come from philosophy, oral traditions, you know, cave petroglyphs. Like there's been vision quests. There's been, as long as humans have existed, um, there seems to be some commonality in um, how we're all seeking to evolve and move through this world with a general state of contentment. And so I really don't even talk about being a spiritual person or a religious person. As I come to my clients, I like to just give them um, good mental processes. I make it very scientific if drama is emotional waste. How do you get rid of waste, a better mental process? And there are so many resources out there that help us ask better questions, self-reflect, contemplate, give good mental processes. So much of even what I benefit from in my own life doesn't come from even reading spiritual texts. It comes from reading poetry. You know, David White talks about poetry. Poets use language against which we have no defense. Like poets really get a question down to the essence of something. And when we read it, we can, it just goes right into us because they found the perfect language. Um, and so for me, I, I just, there are 7,000 paths and all of them have commonalities about what we're asking as far as the questions. And so I focus on those universal principles. And when people find out, you know, there's just something about a truth that we have no defense against. People are like, oh my gosh, that makes sense and it feels better. It doesn't matter where it came from. Let's use more of that. Wonderful. And you talk about higher power. You share a letter that you wrote to your son in the book. And it, that, I mean, that really resonated with me. But obviously, you believe in interconnectivity, higher power, all of that. You don't give it the label spirituality, but it is about something bigger than, than us. People ask me what I believe, like, if you're a Buddhist, you'll come up and go, I see Buddhism in the, if you're a Christian, you'll come up and you go, I see so much Christianity. If, um, you know, you practice um, Hinduism, you'll see that. And what I love about that after I give talks is that, um, you know, people look at you through your own mirror, their own mirror, They'll, someone will come up and say, I can see that you're in recovery. And, um, and I'm, I'm glad to be that eclectic and universal. I absolutely believe that we are part of something so big and that it isn't about us as individuals. Like we're part of some just beautiful collective that um, together is genius and we have all that we need, um, all of that. Once we, in my mind, we have to transcend duality and we have to get really good at impermanence. Um, it was a hard decision whether to include that letter in the book um, it was a letter I wrote to my son when he was in a treatment program and his counselor had asked him to ask people um, about their belief in a higher power. And, you know, I'm not sure I ever talked to my kids about like religion or spirituality or, and he asked me that and my answer to his question, like, you know, mom, what do you see as your higher power? Um, was one of those moments of inspired writing where I just wrote down and then like 30 minutes just poured my heart out. And it was something I had kept in my journal for a long time. It was just one of those, we all write those things. When you look back, you go, that's, I love that. That really says what I mean. And with his permission, I included it um, in the book because I think it shows all of us how much more in common we have than we think when it comes to belief systems. Absolutely. It really very much resonated with me. So thank you for that. And uh, my next question is around asking yourself um, the right questions and checking our word usage. So about the word or, um, using the word or leads to dual or dichotomous thinking. So can you give us examples of that and how to change our wording um, to be happier? There's a common theme I see when people feel deflated or in despair or locked in or see no options. Their mind has gotten them into, some people call it the prisoner's dilemma or the sucker's choice. There are oftentimes people come to me in coaching or back when I was a counselor with questions and they just feel so stuck. They can't find answers. And what is sometimes surprising to people is I say, let's stop looking for answers. The answers you're going to find with that question just aren't going to be answers that that are breakthrough or transcendent. 
I believe that if you're stuck, listen to the questions you're asking and improve your questions because with better questions come better answers. When I was doing research work in my master's degree, my professors were so particular about my research question. It took forever to get approved. They were talking about among and between and like little tiny nuances in words. But what they guaranteed me is once we have the question to be a really great question, the research will just follow. And that has always stuck with me. And so when I find myself stuck, I back up, what questions am I asking myself? And are they even good questions? So a lot of people with jobs or relationships ask questions like, should I stay or should I go? That question will lead you into ambivalence. It will lead you floundering. It will lead you not in your relationship or job and not out of it. Anytime you ask a question that says, should I, you're looking to the external world and your conditioning. What is, what would a good girl do? Or what would a responsible father do? Or you're looking to the outside world to define who you are. And part of happiness is shedding your conditioning and finding out who you really are. Questions that have or in them only set you up to, should I leave, should I go? Like both of those answers are horrible. One is I trash my whole life and I'm alone. And the other one is I stay in an intolerable situation. Um, also just lock you in. Um, and questions like that keep it so conditional. If we have a good weekend together, I should stay. And if we have a bad weekend together, I should go. Or if it's a good, I have a good performance review, I'll stay. And it just makes us so jockeyed around that we exhaust ourselves. And a lot of you are in a place where with your jobs, with your relationships, you're exhausted. So when I get exhausted, I believe that if you're involved in a conversation that's exhausting, don't try to improve the conversation, end it and begin a new conversation. And new conversations come with better questions. So I was asking myself about a relationship. Should I say, should I go? And it was exhausting. And then I just decided I would ask different questions. Question number one is, was I fulfilled? Right now, was I fully fulfilled? Was I, was this all that I had hoped for in life? And when the answer came back, no, I had to ask myself, like, what's my soul craving? And you'll know you're on a good question because it cannot be answered in a moment. It is a walking meditation. What's my soul craving? I've been so disconnected. I didn't even know. And I had to look around and I saw symbols. When I looked at my bookshelf, all my books were on a certain topic. I had bought a necklace that was all about the liberation I'd worn for a year and a half. Like, I looked around and my journaling year after year had key words. Once I answered what's my soul craving, I had more questions come up about, um, you know, have I asked clearly for what I want and why not? What is it I'm afraid of? And for me, all that meditation and instead of searching outside came down to, am I willing for people to be wrong about me to live the life I dream of? And that question was the scariest question I've ever had in my life. And I got very clear about what I wanted. And I went and asked the other person very clearly. They said yes. Their behavior said no. And I had to believe the answer I got. And what I found out is I stay in fantasy so I don't have to feel heartbreak. And I had to get really good at grieving and heartbreak. And so the power of questions, I know I gave you a long answer um, on that, but the power, if you're stuck in life, it is not that you can't find answers. It's that you're not asking questions that um, matter. That is just so impactful and beautifully said, Sai. So, Making amends was another section of the book uh, that really hit home for me. Um, I was once told by a therapist when I was, I, I was suffering from postpartum depression and I was suffering from our in-laws cutting us off and not having any grandparents for our kids. And it was just, you know, a brutal time. And I remember her saying it, being angry or resentful to someone is like swallowing poison and expecting it to hurt 
the other person. And you got at the, at the same thing in, in your book about anger and forgiveness and the art of a true apology. So can you um, briefly sum that up for us in terms of um, an example and how the book gets at that? Yeah. And I think there are some basic life skills we don't learn. How to make an amends and apology, like how to move through heartbreak. And um, and anger and resentment are different for me. Anger is what I can feel and I sit with it until it tells me its name so I can move through the world differently. Resentment is my unwillingness to move on. Like it's my wanting something that will never happen. It's my wishful thinking. But, um, you know, when you're making a good amend, you've got to uh, one really name and own what it is that you did without because you did this without anything. Just if you are ready to make an amends, you'll know because you have one clean statement about I chose or I did or I acted with no justification just like one sentence. And then you need to show insight if you want this amend to truly hit. And insight is, and I can see now that my wanting to protect myself really left you unprotected. I have to show insight how my behavior affected you. And I have to actually say the words, I am truly sorry. I regret that. I wish I had done differently. A lot of times we make amends without ever actually saying, I messed up, I am sorry. And then instead of us figuring out how to make it up to people, I like to ask them, what could I do to make this right by you? And people may not accept that. They can walk away, You, it's not your business what they do with your amends. That's crazy, right? It hurts. But you have to then give people freedom to do whatever they need to do. Just because you apologize doesn't mean they've healed. Just because somebody apologizes to me doesn't mean I have to totally forgive. Sometimes I will only forgive like 80%. Why? Because I want to remember in my life that lesson so that I don't um, open myself up in, in the same way. And I have found that as an adult, a lot of times we get into adult relationships, new ones, expecting them to fix childhood wounds. And as an adult, I need to fix my own childhood wounds. I needed my father at one point in my life when I was just becoming an adult and I called upon him and he did not come. Instead, he gave me a platitude and a lesson. And there were a couple more times where he just wasn't there for me. And so much so they hurt my feelings. I didn't let him walk me down the aisle when I was married. And I regretted that. It was like drinking poison. Like I wanted him to hurt, but I hurt that I didn't have that dance with my dad that I dreamt of as a little girl. And I was pregnant with my second child. And I really wanted to name him after my father, but I was so mad at my dad. And I kept thinking, he's the adult. He should apologize to me. And that dawned on me. I was 34 years old. I was the adult as well. And I did something courageous. And I went home and apologized to my father without expecting an apology in return. And in fact, I didn't get that apology. I got like some humor. But I tell you what, that reset our relationship in a way that he could show up for me. He was at my child's baptism. I named my son after him. He came, um, my husband dove in a pool and broke his neck. My dad was the first person there. My doing that didn't get me his acknowledgement of how he hurt me. He didn't even remember doing it, but it did get me my dad back. And so there are times you're all waiting for apologies and it's sacred time. If you want that relationship back, forget about receiving the apology, go out there and make a wonderful apology and just open the door for reconciliation. And it may or may not come, but if you're lucky enough that it comes, it's so beautiful. That, yes, very, very, again, uh, authentic, heartfelt. And I think that will help a lot of people because I think a lot of people are holding on to anger and resentment over past hurts. And, and the human condition does lead to a lot of hurt. And a lot of it's unintentional, right? It really is unintentional. Or something something happened and we added story to it. It's like sometimes forgiveness is realizing what you thought happened never even happened. 
Um, but it's such a it's such a big topic. This book is not about how you should live happy. It is saying here are some lessons that freed up my soul. And I offer them to other people in case they help. And it's not something like, oh, I figured this out and now I live perfectly. No, the reason, it, if it made a chapter in my book, it's because I have screwed it up so many times. I've had to look at it very in depth because, um, you know, it's just something, apologies. I still, I'm stubborn, man. I still need to learn um, and remind myself about apologizing. I'm trying to teach our 16 year old that he's our oldest and he just does not like saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> He'll argue it. And yeah, so just trying to teach kids that I think at a young age too is, is important. It's vulnerable. And I think if we can show people when they do admit their vulnerabilities, just unconditional love, we can make it more attractive. But especially sometimes depending on gender and how we socialize people, sometimes we as a society make it harder for people to just say, I am human and I screwed up. Or with hindsight, I would have done that differently. Um, but none of us get through life without the need to make amends. And that's why I think it's just something we need to learn. Exactly. Now, what um, authors, thought leaders, or spiritual leaders um, most resonate with you these days? So what are size resources and go-tos? What's funny is on another podcast, somebody's like, what business books do you read? Because I'm in the business world. I teach people. I'm like, none. Now I have. I'm like, um, so I love Byron Katie. And um, she, her website is thework.com. And I have loved Byron Katie for 20 years. And so she's just one of those she has techniques that I use every day. I, of course, love Marianne Williamson, The Return to Love, The Course in Miracles, um, Eckhart Tolle, um, Alan Watts. I love Sam Harris's Waking Up app. Even though I've been a, a transcendental meditator for years, Sam Harris's work on that app is, is profound. But I would tell you, if you came into my room and you wanted to see what was laying around, um, David White, Mary Oliver, um, Patrick O'Toole, like um, John Donahue, poets. I love poetry. I read poetry every day, real key. Like, oh, I just find so much scrumptiousness in poetry. Mark Nepo has a daily meditation book that's divine. Um, so, so many teachers, but mostly I get my inspiration from listening to and, and reading poetry. David White does three Sundays. Um, a month, these three Sunday series, and he's just a beautiful poet and philosopher. So that's what gets me jazzed. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> I can totally tell. Now you've added to my list, that's for sure. Um, so I know that you're planning to run retreats in, in the Baja or are running them. Tell me more. So in my past life, you know how life comes full circle. So before I was out talking on like large stages about, you know, personal things like life's meant to live happy. Um, I used to do beautiful retreats for um, some women focused and some, you know, um, uh, people focused. And I used to do a lot of taking people hiking and using hiking as a metaphor. Um, and I personally have some of the Kilimanjaro. I just got back from hiking the Inca Trail and um machu and and ending in machu picchu with my sons and but i took many many leaders on different experiential retreats and as the pandemic hit people started calling me and i started talking again more about personal development and my psych background and more um individual like evolution so i think in business Conventionally, we try and develop people, but I think post-rigorous, post-conventional work is all about evolution and how can we gather elders and how can we have people have safe places to um, look at their lives and look within. So I have resurrected, um, now that it's safer to travel, retreats that I now do. I live in the Baja. And it's magical there. So you'll be seeing some schedules come out, but I am doing... Um, retreats where people come down. I do it for corporations, for teams, but I do it for individuals. And uh, we gather brilliant people together and we involve you in evolutionary experiences like asking great questions and experiential activities like hiking and, and some other challenges um, that just help us take time out and, and 
take a little inventory of our world. So am I going to see you on one of my retreats, Dr. Laura? Sign me up. I'm coming to the Baja. <laughs> and I have others who would come too, I'm sure of it. So you have a lot of uh, people that love what you're doing, Sai, here in Canada. Thank you. So do you feel the human race um, has evolved or is evolving overall and that consciousness is rising as a result of this pandemic, Sai? You know, I get asked that question um, often, believe it or not. You know, I don't, um, I don't know our current state, but I know one thing: you can't escape evolution. So, like, it may something may come as a whisper, and then it may come by a two by four to the head. But the good thing, in my belief, about the universe is we'll be evolved with or without ourselves. Um, and I think right now there are some people who have used this as a beautiful time out and they've kind of regrouped their lives. I also know the ego is so good at morphing into um, who we are. Um, but I'm a firm believer in that we are good people trying to do good stuff. Um, I know many of us are on the path of evolution. Um, I just want you to really watch out for duality. A lot of people are like, you know, what side are you on? I'm like, what if there's only one side? We resolve cognitive dissonance when multiple things can be true at once by tapping down into a certainty that's not very accurate, but just feels better. And so my hope is you keep yourself in situations where your mind is blown, your heart's opened, your mind's opened, and you really understand how little we know. So whether or not we evolve, I think, is whether we accept the invitation right now. You will be evolved. I think you just get to decide how you're going to be evolved. It's like this will all, um, you know, it, this is going to end how it ends. We get to decide how and when. Um, we can help ourselves or hurt ourselves. But I do think that people are getting permission to become more aware people are so much more open to questions like i wanted to write this book 10 years ago my publisher was like nobody wants to know that now i wrote this book and so many people are buying it and loving it so i think we're more ready i don't know if we're more evolved but i think our readiness i think we figured out our way isn't working all that well and so people are more open to answers the ego has less firm ground to stand on as in i know what i'm doing leave me alone I think a lot of us are, I'm pretty lonely and I don't know what I'm doing, would you help me? And that's such a beautiful place to be. I love that we're all being undone. Um, and instead of knowing, we're into a lot of mystery and it's in that mystery that life gets really fascinating. That's that's for sure. I feel like I've been growing and learning. I, I'm one of those that has become undone and it's a real growth experience. And again, this really, I'm gonna keep on my bedside, this, is fantastic no ego um and thank you so much sai for all that you are contributing uh to this challenging messy but beautiful world and i'm just delighted so glad to get your call to come back on i um, love my canadian audiences so I've, I've now can probably say i've been in every province so i i feel like i've made the canadian tour i love it up there Wonderful. And I will make the Baja tour myself. So I'll commit to that. <laughs> and um, thank you, everybody, for watching or, or listening to this episode of Where Work Meets Life. And if you liked it, please share it. Please rate it. I'm trying to get this podcast out there to as many people as possible to change life experiences for the better. And you can find uh, my website, drlaura.live, uh, with my monthly e-newsletter, my blog, my articles, and all of my podcasts. So thank you for being here and stay well and have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us today on Where Work Meets Life. I'm passionate about sharing insights from experts around the world on topics at the intersection of where work meets life. If you found this podcast useful, please share with others who may benefit and engage with us on social media. For more articles, information, and tips, sign up for my monthly newsletter at my website, drlaura.live. This podcast summary contains links to the psychology practice I founded. Work Evolution, Canada Career Counseling, and Synthesis Psychology, as well as my current employer, Humans, a nationwide organizational psychology firm focusing on culture and performance. 
Stay well.